Hey Shepard, thanks for being in uh, Grenoble. We are in the middle of uh, your exhibition in the old museum of uh, Grenoble. It's uh, not the main museum, it's the, it was the old museum and there was a library inside. And uh, we got those 1,000 square meters just to present your work. And it's only a third, more or less, of uh, your work that is presented here. So what do you think about uh, being here in Grenoble and uh, doing a mural and everything? Well, it's, it's, um, it's amazing to see this number of my works together because this is the largest number of prints that have ever been shown simultaneously. So um, I focus on the next project more than reviewing what I've done in the past, but it is nice to see it all together because I always feel like I'm behind schedule. I'm not doing enough, but then when I see all of this work, I feel like, okay, there's something to show for it. I feel good about it. Um, but probably the most exciting thing for me being here in Grenoble is um, that I've been able to do all the things that matter to me. Do a really large public piece, a, a mural in an amazing part of town, great, you know, great building facade, and, um, and also show the work here, um, but additionally uh, interact with people, talk with people, whether it's here at the opening or the talk I did at the university or the talk that I did at the museum. Um, it's not often that I get to do all those things together and you, you did a really great job um, giving me opportunities to engage with the world the way that I feel good about. No, I thank you to you and uh, your team because you're traveling with, uh, with four, four amazing guys and, yeah. and, and yeah. that helped you to release a lot of work, but yeah. I was uh, honestly pretty surprised that uh, you were the one just, we weren't telling, okay, we start now, even if that was under the rain, and uh, you're all the time on the, on the lift, yeah. uh, painting a lot, doing more than what you could, or you should do, or you, you, you can do, it's, it's amazing. Why do you work that hard? Well, you know, it's, it's um, yeah, sometimes it's exhausting. Painting the murals is, is just hard work, you know, because this, the technique I use, cutting the stencils on, right on the wall, it, you know, your hands get tired. But, um, but for me, it's, it's very important to just do the work. I've always, I've always uh, felt like um, I can only be... A, a good leader if I'm willing to do the same things that everyone else is doing and I'm lucky to have excellent assistants who are talented and, and work hard but um, it's, it's important for me to do everything that they have to do that uh, for me to, to suffer uh, as much as everyone else suffers because in the end it's my work and I need to you know, I need to take responsibility for the outcome and, um, you know, show that it's, uh, it, you know, it, it's about actually being directly involved in everything. For years, I couldn't afford to hire anyone to help me, so I was used to having to do every single thing myself, whether it was, um, you know, screen printing, um, packing boxes of t-shirts and and shipping them out, calling the stores and asking, can I please get paid? Um, I did everything. So it's a, you know, for me, it's a luxury to be able to focus on um, just the art now. So obviously when I'm working on the art, I'm gonna put all my energy into it because I've worked all these years doing other things that were very unpleasant to get to focus on the part I love the most. Can you let us know what's to the, the motivation about acting like that? Well, I, um, I've always uh, seen art as a really, um, a really powerful tool of communication in that it 
can function in, a, uh, in an emotional way and in an intellectual way, and there aren't that many different things that work like that. I think good filmmaking works that way. I think music can work that way. I think that comedy can work that way. And uh, those things are all understood to have this, this dichotomy or duality, but very few people use visual art in that way. And I, um, I want to make a picture that I think is appealing and powerful, but also that says something that I think is worth saying. And um, the writer Bukowski, I'm paraphrasing, but he said something along the lines of, if something is worth saying, then it's worth saying with style. I think more visual artists need to think about the reverse of that, that if, if it's worth creating something with style, it's worth having something to say. If art can, um, you know, can uh, create a conversation that wouldn't happen otherwise, that it, it can appeal, but it can also provoke, um, you know, I want to push that as, as far as I can. And being prolific is important to me because I look at how many different forms of media people are assaulted with daily and, I, and, and the very rapid metabolism of culture. And I think that the old model of waiting until inspiration strikes and working on a painting for months, that doesn't work with how people process images and information now. So I need to keep pace with the way that people communicate and you know, absorb messages and imagery. And uh, that can be exhausting but I think it's a, a realistic way of making sure that my work connects and, and, and speaks the language of the times. And um, so by speaking the language of the time, can, you, can we talk a little bit about uh, your walk and your pulling stickers, your interacting <laughs> with the city in a really fast and spontaneous way? Yeah, the, I always have a, a pocket full of stickers. Um, one of the things I like about putting stickers up in a city is that a lot of people walk and even something very small can stand out from the cityscape um, in a way that reminds someone that communications in public space don't have to just be commercial advertising or government signage and I started with no money and just with a small sticker and slowly built so for me it's still important to do what is the origin of my work it's uh, you know it's, it's a reminder that from humble beginnings with hard work anyone even without resources can achieve something and, and get attention for the message that they'd like to share and you know, when I started, I didn't um, at first have a serious message. And I, th I think that it, it, even a playful sticker or a playful piece of, of street art reminds people that it's important to have outlets for expression, but there's also the potential that someone sees a way to take that beyond just a bit of creative mischief and, and make it make it meaningful. So putting a sticker up somewhere that someone sees and realizes that's not that hard to do, that can, that can unlock something in them that will motivate them to empower themselves. How could you, I don't know, 30 years ago, start with something that was just perfect and still matching 100% today? Usually in career, it's, things change, you get different orientation or thing, but for you, it's amazing. It just poof. You the, the, the manifesto you 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 put on as a, I don't know the, the first brick or stone of mm -hmm. the edifice that you construct, which is huge today. It was just perfectly shaped, and it's still one of the person value today. Well, thanks. I um, I'm actually surprised because when I wrote the manifesto, I'd only been doing the sticker campaign for one year. But I, I did, I had my own thoughts and I also did some research about the you know, psychology of how people 
process images and, um, and, and I think that the ideas that I used in the manifesto at the time were things I'd witnessed in small ways but made sense as, as, as theories that would hold up and believe it or not, they have. <laughs> but that, um, you know, there was no guarantee of that. And I have evolved in ways, uh, but I also have uh, stayed consistent about the things that matter to me, which are, uh, you know, there's several. There's uh, my pushback against abuses of power and in the, you know, destruction of the environment, the uh, uh, suppression uh, and or oppression of people through surveillance, through authority, um, problems with capitalism, problems with racism, sexism, xenophobia, um, problems with my problems with unnecessary war and violence. But I always look for different ways to touch upon those themes in my work. And sometimes a motif or um, you know, a, a, an element will, from, from the past will come back in my work, but then other things change. So I like the idea of evolution and continuity. So you're acting like a teacher, in fact, because you remind people where we come from, what was the history, the piece like uh, Visitor Welcome or those things remind the uh, yeah the history of America but it's it's the same with us and, and what we saw in Europe those days that people totally forget the Second World War. I'm always trying to find a balance in my work. I do think that educating people through the work in some ways is, is valuable, but no one likes to feel lectured all yeah. the time. So I'm I'm trying to make sure that the work has an element of fun, whether it's fun in the aesthetic or a sense of humor in some of the the copy that I write for the pieces um, having a you know a balance between seriousness and just fun and and something that's enjoyable to look at that's something I'm always trying to work on and um, you know it's hard to put into words what what the right mixture is, but I think you know it when you see it. And as I'm working, I'm experimenting with what is going to be the, the dominant element, what it, or will be the secondary elements, what phrasing I'll use. And it's a lot of experimentation to get it to feel resolved and ready to share. So I, I spend a lot of time, even with pieces that look simple, taking minimal ingredients and, and making sure that they work well together. Yeah, your work evolved a lot also. In the same, in certain ways, it's still the same, as pretty simple, but the technique, the, the, uh, the details and everything, mm -hmm. that's, you can see the, the evolution of your work. Do you want to go somewhere, going to more minimalistic, things or you're gonna add more and more messages in one piece? Do you get an idea where you're going or it's a... Well, you know, um, sometimes I, I, um, I'm frustrated because I'll feel that I didn't communicate it enough in, a, enough in a piece, but if I add more, it would have become too busy. But then in recent work, I found what I think is a solution to that, and that is the rips with the newspaper articles that allow me to have a more dominant image, but then secondary communications that feel like they belong rather than competing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, also the, the concept of the rips that we're always in a state of competition about whose message gets to be pushed to the front. So I think that aesthetically and conceptually, that was a breakthrough for me to use the rips, the patterns with more dominant portraits or other elements and um, I'm, I'm enjoying working in that direction but still sometimes I find something that I'm not using that aesthetic because I think it works better in an older, older style and sometimes I'm using shades of blue now which for years I only used red, black, cream, gold 
Um, occasionally, I would use green in something that was environmentally themed or, um, or the Black Power series. But um, what I found um, evolving the colors is that enough of my style is recognizable that people are following it. But for years, when people would only see maybe one thing here, one thing there, and um, I wasn't as well known with a, a, an audience that was following every move I make, it was more important for me to stay consistent so that people could connect the dots between the pieces. Yeah. And um, you know, now I have more, more leeway. Well, talking about the old style, can you let us know a little bit of the message behind the rose gold mural that you just achieved because it's coming from a 2008 piece? Yeah, the, the rose girl I, I, I created while the Iraq war was still going on. And I was um, at the time doing a lot of pieces opposed to the Iraq war, but I was also doing um, pieces around um, environmental themes as well. So I saw the rose girl as a positive symbol, open to interpretation, but of peace and harmony with humanity and with nature with the ecology and um, I mean the, the there are still wars going on there are still terror attacks there's still violence and climate change is a problem that has not been addressed properly and is urgent so I think that that piece is as relevant now as it was in 2008 and it, it's amazing to um, have something like that here on such a large scale. I've never made a mural of that piece, so it was a great opportunity. But um, it's a great coincidence that three roses are the symbol of Grenoble. So um, I wasn't trying to uh, do something that would sort of be, you know, patriotic for the city. But it's, uh, you know, it ends up with that, and it's a, it's a nice connection. Um, I, I hope that the mural is something that appeals to people, but more than anything, if it's an entry point to discovering the rest of my work, that's very valuable to me. We're talking about uh, images that are opening doors, or there is, uh, there is another image that you put in the city and is going to question the person. <laughs> so, well, that's, and that's pretty connected with your original work, you know, when yeah. you're doing things on rooftops or yeah. something like that. So the, how, was to do, how was it to do this? It was great. Um, it's a, the, the horizontal three-face icon that I originally created in January of 1996. I had a major breakthrough in, in early 1996 of the series of images that were inspired mostly by Russian constructivism, but also a little bit by Barbara Kruger's work. And I have put up that three-face image illegally many times. I've, I've done some legal spots with it, but the center part, the icon face, has been my primary image since 1996 for what I bomb on the streets. And um, to get to do this rooftop, which is very, very visible, is, is great because that icon face is, um, it's, it's, a, a, it's a reminder to people of all the um, monolithic forces of oppression and authority that we need to be cautious of. Don't give too much power to someone that doesn't have your best interest in mind because you'll regret it. And, um, uh, that image up there, um, yeah, I hope, I hope it's seen as sort of a look back at Big Brother. Big Brother's watching you, but we're watching you back. And, um, it, it, you know, some people will like it. Some people will feel that it's ominous, but it's, it's meant to do that. And it's meant to say, if that bothers you, think about things like that that should also bother you and don't just complain, do something about it. So it's a 23 years old piece, yeah. and still 100 persons at it today. <laughs> so. Because it's so um, open to interpretation in each, in how, how 
surveillance, whether it's digital or, um, you know, or, or, you know, surveillance cameras in the city or um, police abusing authority, politicians abusing authority, corporations abusing their power. These things, maybe the, how they work changes a little bit, but it's constant through history and, and you know, it will remain relevant.